Alrighty, so welcome to Stapler Two Heads. Now normally for this presentation I have my trusty staple gun because wouldn't it be nice if we could just get the piece of the information that we want to deliver to people, go up and go, look, just sit quietly, it won't hurt you, me much, you a little bit, and I'm just going to staple this to your head. Who has ever felt like that? Yeah, yeah. okay, it would be so much... Sorry? Sorry, can opener, just open it. Can opener, yeah, just, you know, get the can opener, get the flip top head happening, pour in all the information. Ah, job done. <laughs> I don't know, I don't think even that it works these days. Here's the challenge that we have. We are in infomania at the moment. We are being pummeled with information. I read, there was something I read recently that suggests that we make, um, that there's been more information that's been developed in the last five years than there has in the last 50,000 50, or something, something, something ridiculous, it's just escalating beyond belief. And I also read somewhere that we make more decisions in a day than our ancestors did in a year, which I thought, how the hell does that work? We make more decisions in a day than our ancestors did in a year. And then I thought about our ancestors, because this is what they were doing. They would wear the same clothes every day. They would live in the same place every day. They would eat the same food every day. They would put their hand out the window and go, oh, it's not raining, therefore I plough the field. Now, how many decisions did you guys have to make just to get here today? Yeah, I know. Well, with me, it's kind of looking at my wardrobe going, OK, well, that doesn't fit, and then that needs repairing, and then that needs to go to the dry cleaner. Oh, well, this is what I end up with. <laughs> but it's just everything. The emails. The average executive gets around 80 emails a day. So that even if it's just, do you need this enlargement product, and you need to, no, delete, it still requires a decision. And this is what happens, is we end up looking like this. And I, the people that are attending your workshop are looking like this. Because they're going, you know what, my brain's full. My brain is bursting. Perhaps you want me to learn some new legal stuff? My brain's full. And the problem is, is that when we get a full brain, decisions became, becomes very difficult. This was a study done by a couple of psychologists who had some jam. Uh, they set up a, a, a table of jam in a busy supermarket. And there were six different varieties of jam. So they had strawberry jam, apricot jam, you know, different types. I said, come and try the jam. And if you try the jam, you get a dollar off your next purchase. Now, if you're like me, shopping with kids, you always go for the free samples. So you go in there, you try the jam, you say, oh, what do you reckon, guys? Should we get this one? Yeah, OK. And you take it away to the checkout and get a dollar off. Yay. About 250 people stopped at the table. And they went, that's enough. Next busy Saturday, they set up the table again, same location this time with 24 jars of jam. Come and try the jam, and if you try the jam, you get a dollar off your next purchase. So which table sold more jam? Yep, why, so someone said here the first, and why do you think? <coughs> because the other one had too many choices and you can't remember. Here's the interesting thing. Of those two tables, the first table sold, uh, uh, sorry, what was it, it was about 30% of the 250 people stopped and tried, I'm um, sorry, bought, of, sorry, bleh, rewind, blah, 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 blah. of the 250 people that stopped, 30% bought. Of the 24 jars of jam, of the 250 people that stopped, only 3% bought. This is what happens when we're given too much information. Our brain shuts down, we go, what, 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 and we go, it's too hard, and we walk away. First table was full of jam or just? Yeah, six jars of jam, 250 people stopped, 30% bought. The second table, 24 jars of jam, 250 people stopped to taste, but only 3% bought. And uh, now, Kurt, yes? Yep, Kurt, uh, Carl, sorry, Carl and I, we're, we're, Carl's in sales, I've got a sales background. We know this. We know that if we give people too much information, they'll walk away. They'll go, <laughs> It's too hard. And when you're a trainer, you're selling. You're basically selling real estate, real estate in the brain. And so we need to see how we can get that real estate in the brain. Because at the moment, people are being overwhelmed with information. So let's test this little theory with a memory test. So now with your little piece of paper here, 
you fold it in half. Those of you viewing from home, fold your piece of paper in half. And on one side, you can turn it like that if you like. And on one side, put the numbers 1 to 10 down here. And in the middle, 11 to 20. So let's do this really quickly because we don't... Oh, actually, I've been... By the way, I've been given a little bit extra time. We, we're going till around about uh, 10 past 12. So I've got a little bit of extra time. So 1 to 10 on one side and then 11 to uh, 20 on the other. Beautiful, got that, excellent, pop your pens down, pop your pens down at home, I can see you, you don't think I can, but I can, because we're going to do a little bit of memory test. So I'm going to give you just a few seconds to remember these 20 words, and I need you to remember them in order. So let, I'll just give you a minute, should be long enough, I think. We need some thinking music. I reckon that should be long enough. Now, before you pick up your pens, because this is the thing, isn't it? Practice doesn't always come directly after our learning. Before you pick up your pens, have a chat to the person next to you. You guys can go back to your funny cat videos that you've been watching simultaneously on the computer. Hey, you know, check out a couple of videos. Have a chat to the person next to you about what you had for brekkie. <laughs> so, come on. What did you have for brekkie? <laughs> the whole enchilada? What are we talking? <laughs> Hash browns? All the stuff that you're not allowed at home? <laughs> and delay the cholesterol test for a while now? <laughs> yeah. No. No, but it's stuff. It's stuff that you do special when you go away, isn't it? You better do the stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know how tempting it is to look at someone else's piece of paper, but please don't. Off you go. Write all those 20 words down in order. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> it's easy. So at home, grab your little piece of paper. No cheating. Write them all down in order. I can't remember any of them. Have we got it blacked out on the screen? Yes. Yeah, because I was going to say otherwise they, they've got a bit of a head start. I'm not sending you to a sh <laughs> shopping. You'll come home with 20 things that we don't actually need. <laughs> Carl, he's completely given up. No, I can't remember. You got one. <laughs> Chuck it down. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 more seconds because trust me when I say this, more time won't actually help this exercise. Mm. Okay, so swap it with somebody next to you. Those at home, I'm trusting you to be honest here. Or if you're in a room with somebody, you can swap it with someone next to you. And let's see how you did. Now, you get, you get two points. Hang on, scoring. Scoring's all about the score. Two points if you have the right word in the right place. So if you've got number one paper, you score two points. If you've got the right word, but you put it in the wrong place, then you get one point. So the total is 40. It's out of 40. Two points for the right word in the right place. You're going to find it very easy to score, aren't you? Yeah. What did he get? Okay, you you can be the judge on that. You can give him one one or two points. <laughs> so mark it out of forty. Hand it back to the person. Have a look. Cry on the inside. <laughs> And then flip that piece of paper over, please. 
Okay, so everyone's handed it back and marked it. We've got someone here who's doing due diligence. The legal lady's got it done very quickly. Okay, have a look at your score, cry on the inside and then flip it over. Excellent. Everyone's got it flipped over? Flip it over, flip it over. Beautiful. Okay, so how long do you think our attention span is these days? Because when I first came a trainer, I was told 20 minutes. Was anyone else told 20 minutes? Our attention span is 20 minutes? No? Okay, so I was the only one told that. Yeah. How long do you think it is now? About seven minutes. About seven minutes? Why do you think seven minutes? Yeah, they, I think a lot of people say it's around about seven minutes because the ad breaks are seven minutes. But here's the interesting thing is this research I found by Gonzalez and Mark suggests it's round about 11 minutes. Now, it's not that we're getting dumber. It's just the fact that we're processing so much information, we're increasing the cognitive load, and we're going, we're hitting saturation point. There's two other things that are affecting our, our uh, attention span here. One is relevance to me, and, the other, and the, the other one is well, cognitive load, which I've just talked about. I've got two kids, they're 11 and 13. How long do you think their attention span is if I give them a new video game? Four. Three hours. <laughs> yeah, three hours. So why is that? Firstly, is it relevant to them? Yeah, because yeah, all their friends are talking about it at school. They're really excited to be able to play this video game. The second thing is, you know, the video games are interesting because they start off easy, don't they? They start off with you, you kind of, you know, run around and you shoot a couple of targets and you go, oh, this is easy. And then what do you do? You get a gold coin, you unlock a better, a better, a better archery, you know, better bows and arrows and you can shoot more targets and you can go up to the next level and, gets it, and what happens then? Yeah, it gets a bit harder. It gets a bit harder and harder. But do they say, oh, this, do they say, oh, this is all too hard now or no? They're going, this is, yes, this is great. So they're drip feeding the cognitive load. How, which is why gamification is becoming so big at the moment. The trouble too with those words, well, I've got, I've got, I'm trying to look for a pattern or, a, or, or something to hook it onto, or like a memory hook or something. Yep. It's just too, it's just too random. To oh, yes, to yes, to yes. Like but we're going we're to re-examine that and see what we can do. We, can we do a memory hook with that? Because you're quite right. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to talk about how we need to sell when we become a trainer. Because good salespeople make stuff stick. We were, uh, Carl and I were having a chat about the sales process and we talked about a few things. This is, Carl's just going to go, yeah, I know all of this. This is, yeah, so resonates because it's really important. We're looking for brain space and we need to be able to sell our ideas. So the first thing we need to do is have a really strong objective. Now I'm talking about an objective that you can explain in one sentence. Because when I talk to people Oh, I don't have it here, but when I talk to people about sales, uh, about objectives, they generally go, oh, yes, this is our learning outcomes, here's our objectives. And there's two pages full of stuff. And people already are going, <laughs> and hyperventilating, going, you're going to chuckle that jam at me? So I want you to have a think about what your objective is. Now, I was chatting, uh, training some guys that were forklift operators, and his objective was, my objective is to have them be confident and competent forklift operators. That's it. So that was his, what I call an umbrella statement, to be confident and competent forklift operators. So just have a quick chat about what's your objective. Have you thought about what's the objective for this workshop that you're running on the day and what's your overriding objective? Because if you can't clarify that in one sentence, your people aren't going to get it because it's too much. So I'll just give you 30 seconds to have a chat with the person next to you about what's your objective. Oh, just when you're running a workshop. Oh, mm. okay, yeah. Okay, and I'm sorry, I know we haven't had a chance for everyone to have a, have a chat, but this is how I want you to think, because this is the sales process I'm going to be going through. This is Selling 101. If you walk into a store, 
This is what good salespeople do. They get your attention. We talked about this, the meeting and greeting. Then they find out what you need. So, welcome, you know, what are you looking for today? Okay, so you're going um, uh, camping and you need some really good strong boots. Excellent. Now, let me show you these boots that have won the Australian Design Award and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're Australian made as well. So now we're using, uh, well, should we include the word new there? So we're using some emotive words. It's new, it's Australian, etc. That's all great. And guess what? We've got 10% off which is fabulous, so will that be cash or charge? So this is you know, Selling 101. Now how this works with you and your presentation is this, you have your objective. Your objective does not look like this. Your objectives is not the work, workshop objectives which tends to make your participants hyperventilate by the way, so please get rid of it. Your objective is an umbrella statement where you ask yourself what is it I want them to do, say, think or feel. So for Carl it might be something like I want them to be professional salespeople that sell lots of cars ethically, something like that, and feel good about it. For you, what was, electricity, I want them to be competent electrical personnel that are confident in their ability and that can come home safely. You want them to be safe. But have a think about what do you want them to do, say, think or feel. You want them to be able to do this activity, you want them to be able to say, wow, that was great, very valuable information, I'm going to take that on board, I think that's great, and I feel comfortable about it. Because the thing that stops most of us from doing something is this, is how we feel about something. So don't underestimate that feeling. So it's not just we want them to be competent, we want them to feel confident as well, to feel that they can do this, to feel that this is something they can incorporate into their activities. Alrighty, so the good old strong umbrella statement for someone in Oak Health and Safety, it might be I want them to be able to recognise a risk and be able to resolve it. So I'm not going to teach them about the Oak Health and Safety Act because that's boring and they don't need to know it. What they need to know is they need to know how to recognise a risk and be able to act on it. So we're going to do role plays and practical and I'm going to show them videos and things like that. Okay, so there's your objective. Now we go back to our little sales things. The first thing is get people's attention. How long, oh, I might have a slide on this, yes, how long do you think it takes when you start your training presentation or any presentation and the audience is sitting there and they're thinking, oh, this is going to be good or this is going to be not so good. How long do you think it takes for them to make that decision? You reckon seconds, anyone else? Minute? About three minutes, About three minutes you're, oh dear, well, you're in for some sad news here because you're limited to ten seconds. This was a study done by the Harvard School of Psychology where they got a whole lot of uni students, put them in a room, gave them all stopwatches, showed them some videos, and on average it took them 10 seconds to decide whether this is going to be a great presentation or a really crappy one. This is the challenge that we have. As trainers, we often start with Okay, a bit of housekeeping, everybody. The exits are out there, the toilets are out there, and if you see a fire, I'll be running, try and keep up. You know, or we start with something like, oh, I just need to fix up my PowerPoint presentation. Just talk amongst yourselves for a bit. Or we start with this huge list of learning objectives which tends to freak people out. So you've got 10 seconds. So what you need is you need a 10-second grab. So a 10-second grab is a startling statistic it's a hypothetical question, it's a story, it's a quote. It's something that grabs them by their ears and gives them a little bit of a Liverpool kiss. It gets them on task. Because if you don't have a grab, you might be doing a really great job as a trainer, but you're, you're going to be running at the very start because you're trying to catch up with them or trying to get them to catch up with you. So does that make sense? So with your, with your presentation, uh, there was a woman in Adelaide who worked at one of the lowest socioeconomic schools and she was a science teacher and she won the Australian Science Teacher of the Year. And she was quoted in the paper and she, her first line was, she said, the start of the class is not the time to call the roll. The start of the class is time for an explosion. Because all the kids would be going, oh my God, we've got science now, quick! We don't want to be late because uh, we're going to see an explosion. Now, even though she had a really tough class, lower socioeconomic, a lot of these kids got in the top 5% marks in the, in, the, in, the, in the state, which is just unbelievable. 
So she started off with an explosion because she knew the importance of a 10 second grab. Alrighty, so we've got the attention. Now the need. The need is all very well and good because you've got your objective and so your objective is to have them being competent and confident and all that jazz. But now we need to think about what the audience wants because what we're trying to uncover here is the WIFM. Now, anyone knows what WIFM stands for? What's in it for me? Because they're coming into your session going, you know, and I imagine uh, poor Carl over here gets quite a few jaded salespeople like me coming in going, okay, yeah, what are you going to teach us? Right, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Because they're all thinking, what's in it for me? You've got your fabulous objective, that's great, but they, all they care about is what's in it for me. So your job is to uncover that with them. Try and find out what it is about this topic that's going to engage and excite them. Because unless you can ca capture that with them, they're going, you're not getting into my brain. I'm not going to give you any re brain real estate at all. Because you have, it's, not rele it's not relevant to me. Oh, health and safety, Psh, other people get electrocuted, not me. Here's your sweet spot, straight in the middle here. Anything that's not relevant to your audience or relate, oops, related to your objective is you don't talk about it. Because all this stuff around the outside here, that's just clutter. It all comes down to meeting your objective, being relevant to the audience, there's your sweet spot. Now, for those of you in RTOs, you're going to have to shovel a lot of stuff out of the way to get down to this sweet spot. But I can tell you now, if you're presenting 24 important points, they're never going to remember them. So, just refreshing quickly, we've got attention. How long do we have to get attention? 10 seconds. Ten seconds. Tragic, I know. We've got attention. We've looked at their need. We're uncovering their WIFM. The next one in the sales process is emotion. Why? Because people buy on emotion and justify their purchase with logic. Oh, there's a quote there. Yay. People buy an emotion and justify their purchase with logic. I w had a one of, one of my, uh, a woman who attended one of my courses, and she was presenting slides like this. So she was from the Australian Red Cross, and she was speaking to high school kids. Now, if you have a look at this, it's a little bit of a history lesson on the Red Cross. And I asked her, I said, so, Sue, what's your objective here? And she said, oh, my objective is to educate them about the Red Cross. And I said, no, that's not your objective. And she went, oh, okay then. Um, my objective is to get them interested in what kind of blood type they might have. And I said, no, nah, that's not your objective either. And she went, right. Um, I said, look, here's the thing. You're being paid by the Red Cross to go and speak to high school kids. Why? Okay, I want them to donate blood. Yes, now we have an objective. So is this relevant to her objective? Will this encourage people to donate blood? The guy on the, in front of the computer is going, no. Is this relevant to her audience? Is this going to appeal to Gen Ys? No. So it's a bum bum on both counts. So I said to her, I said, Sue, are you feeling brave? And she said, yes, I am. I'm here because I want to do something different. different. And I said, great. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to walk up on stage and say, hey, everybody, my name's Sue. I'm from the Red Cross. And today I've come along because I'm looking for heroes. Now, you don't need to fly in on your invisible plane. You don't need to wear your undies on the outside of your pants. And there's no need for a cape or working out at the gym. What you need to do is donate a bit of time and a bit of blood and you can save a life. You can save little Bobby's life here. Because Bobby's got such an unusual blood disorder that he needs blood products every six weeks just to stay alive. And you know that guy that um, was in that accident up on the freeway? He lost so much blood, but thankfully there were 25 heroes there that gave him enough blood to keep him alive. So I'm looking for heroes. You'll get a Mars bar, you'll get a can of Coke as well, and we'll give you a badge to thank you for your time. I'll be standing by the door on the way out if you want to have a chat. So, short, sharp, really emotive story. It's emotional because I talked about little Bobby, but it's also emotional because I made you feel good about it. And you made a decision based on that emotion that, yes, I'm going to donate some blood. So emotion. So we've covered a couple of things now. Oh, it's time for us to try our memory test again and put in some of those things that we're talking about. Now, don't make sure you've got the blank side. And once again, do the numbers 1 to 10 and 11 to 20. And we'll see if we can improve your score.
So those of you listening from home, get out the piece of paper. Don't look at the other one. Get out a new piece of paper, 1 to 10, 11 to 20. <clears throat> All righty, can everyone stand up, please? We know that people, there's not, no such thing as learning styles, but there are such things as learning preferences. But we know that people all, we're all visual, we're all auditory, we're all kinesthetic, we're all of that. So if we can combine all of this, we're going to learn better. It's going to create something that's sticky and you can staple it to your head. So this is what we're going to do, is we're going to create a story and we're going to create actions as well. So everyone join in with me, please. Join in at home as well. Grab your newspaper. Everyone, we're shaking that paper. We're shaking the paper. We're reading the paper. And what do we see on the paper is we see a picture of a crocodile. Show us the teeth. Come on, Damon. Show us teeth. This is not a crocodile. Okay, crocodiles have teeth. So this is a crocodile. Crocodile with teeth. And we're looking at this crocodile. This is a bit unusual because the crocodile is wearing a dress. Okay, show us the dress. Yeah, nice, no, very nice. Show us the dress. Lovely dress this crocodile's wearing. And on the bottom of the dress, there's, you pick it up and you go, ah, look at this, there's a thread on the bottom of the dress. And what is it, folks? It's dental floss. So you're doing the dental floss, brushing your teeth, or whatever you do with dental floss. And you're looking at the end of the dental floss. Show us what's on the end of the dental floss. What is it? It's a lollipop. If you'll taste it, what's your favorite flavor? Lollipop. Chocolate? It's a chocolate lollipop, OK? Chocolate lollipop. And then you drop it. Oh, no! You reach into your pocket to get the tissue, to go down and pick up your lollipop. Ah! And while you're down there, you're looking at your shoe because your shoe has started to ring. Ring, ring. <laughs> it's one of those shoes. So it's ringing. Your shoe is ringing and on the end of the, sh uh, uh, on the, end of the line is a policeman. And the policeman says, we have a poster out. Show us the poster. Yep. Now, everyone step to the side. Why? Because that's going to remind you that we're now all step to the side, that we're starting a new line. So, starting a new line, and on the poster is a monkey. And the monkey is in the shed. And in the shed is a table. And on the table is a basket. And in the basket is a beautiful flower. And you're looking at this beautiful flower thinking, this is a little weird, because the flower is wearing a bow tie. And you're going, what's a flower wearing, wearing a bow tie for? Bow tie. Have a close look at the bow tie. Oh, no. It's got a picture of eggs on there. How bizarre. And while you look at these eggs thinking, why is eggs on the bow tie? You're looking at your watch and you're thinking, what time is it? Time for bed. What do you dream about? Reindeer. Okay, because this is where the kinesthetic, lear kinesthetic learning comes in. You know, it's the action stuff that, you know, creates these memories as well. So let's do that again. What are you doing reading a paper? Paper. What's on the paper? What's on the paper? Oh, crocodile. Show us the teeth. There's something weird about this crocodile. Why? Because he's wearing a what? A really nice dress. What's hanging off the bottom of the dress? Pick it up. Eh, it's dental floss. On the end of the dental floss is lollipop. Oh, my God, you drop it. So what do you need to do? Reach into your... Get a tissue, you bob down there, ring, 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 ring. What's, what's ringing? Your shoe. Your shoe. Pick it up, telephone. Oh, the policeman, the policeman, ring, a poster out. Step to the side. And on the poster is what? Monkey. Monkey. The monkey's sitting in where? The shed. And in the shed is a table. On the table is a basket. The basket is a beautiful flower. And the flower's wearing something weird. Bow tie. What's on the bow tie? Eggs. What time is it? Hmm. Okay. Now, once again, we know that the practical stuff doesn't always follow the training. So sit down, have a chat. No, those of you can go back to your cat video, you know, on your on your laptop. Have a chat about what you had. What's your favourite meal? Your favourite meal. You're on death row. You can in include this gentleman behind you here. What's your favourite meal? Oysters, really?
Okay, so we've had a bit of discussion here. We've got pasta, we've got oysters, we've got, what was over here? Italian, Italian yeah. <laughs> Lasagna and a really good salad, yeah. Now, once again, don't look at your, your next door neighbours. Off you go. Visualise. Use the actions. This gentleman's already beat his score of one. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the story. If you're having trouble, if you're getting stuck, go back to the story. Think of the actions. And then if you get stuck, ask yourself, so what comes next? What comes next? <laughs> oh, got a couple of people who finished already. Everyone's still going. Very impressed here, folks. Doing a good job. <laughs> Did you get down to bed? What did you dream about? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's simple, but amazing. Okay, I'm just going to give you another 10 seconds because if you haven't got it all out by now, Yeah. Oh, you're so close. There'll be times at Cicero when they've been writing the thing down. Yes. Yes, great technique. Yeah, incorporate that into your training. Yeah. Okay, so pass it to someone. He's going, no, five more seconds. Pass it to someone. Have a check. Once again, two points if you get the right word in the right place. One point if it's the right word in the wrong place. It's out of 40. <coughs> well, we've got a few perfect scores here, have we? Yeah. And look, here's the thing, is if you've got a perfect score, that's fabulous. But what I'm looking for is, did you do better than the first time? Hands up if you did better the first than the first time. Everybody here put their hands up. Yep, because everybody did better than the first time. So the moral to the story here is, if you include a story, if you include physical actions, if you do something silly, something outrageous, something fun, it will become more sticky. If it's more sticky, people are more likely to hang on to it. It's going to be in their memory. They're going to be able to recall it. And, and then if you can motivate them to act on that as well, it's all good. So coming back to our sales an analogy here, we have got attention, we've got need, we've got emotion. Now, p p throw in a bit of logic. It's always good, but I want you to think of this quote here. Because too many people think that it needs to be technical. Technical is not sticky. Technical is boring. So use simple words. Think like a wise man or a wise woman, but communicate the language of the people. It doesn't have to be technical. Give us a story, share an analogy, make it simple. I, I did a presentation to a whole lot of lawyers once, and they said, oh, we expected something a little bit more technical. And I said, no, you were hoping for something more technical, because if it was technical, you could say, well, that's too hard. We can't do that. I wanted to make it simple for you so that you can put it into place straight away. There's no escaping. 
And the last thing is action. And I think as trainers, this is some of the it's hardest thing that we can do. When you're selling something, you can say, well, that'd be cash or charge. But as, how do we ask for action as a trainer? Well, I think what we, what we can do is um, a couple of things that I've used in the past, and you probably use them as well, is something like, what are you, as a result of this information, what are you going to stop, start, or continue doing? Get them to write down a few things under stop, start. When I run presentation skills, people will say, well, I'm going to stop writing out my speech word for words. They say, I'm going to start with a grab, and I'm going to continue using eye contact because that's you know, really working for me really well. So you know, this is a way, for them to, a way for you to ask for action. But for me, it's something that could be simple as, so what do you think? And just saying, is this doable? So is what I've been talking about, is this doable? Yeah? OK, so we had someone say yes, and we had Ian here who nodded his head. So already, he's making space in his brain saying, this is doable. I'm not saying, OK, Ian, this is what you need to do. Because if I say that to Ian, Ian's going to cross his arms and go, yeah, make me. But if I say, is this doable? And Ian says, yes, it is. And you've done a good job. You've done these steps. People will make their own space. They'll make that decision. And we, this is the other thing that we know. We know that people come to training and they do a fabulous, it has a fabulous job, they love it, and then over time it trickles away. So we need to put little reminders in. These are the little staples that you have, whether it's a saying, whether it's a, a badge, whether it's some kind of online forum that they're involved in, because this will help remind them of this valuable information that will reinforce it. So for those of you that are seeing the same people all the time, make sure that you reinforce this. Particularly important with if you, any kind of training you're doing is to get back off and I'll do a half-day workshop and a free one-hour follow-up. And the free one-hour follow-up is to reinforce everything that we've been talking about. Oh, there he goes. What are you going to... Um, oh, this, sorry, this is something else that I designed for some salespeople. They were losing, I think, a quarter of a million dollars worth of product every year because they were... Um, saying yes when they should be saying no to customers and the customers were running off with the product and not paying for it. So I devised this very simple system for them, is that the yes customers offer cash. Yes, we can deliver that within 24 hours. The maybe customers, we have got a good credit rating, but we need to set up an, um, an account for them. The absolute no customers, I know you're great salespeople and you really want to sell this stuff, but if they don't have a good credit rating, and if they, we can't, um, they won't allow us the process to go through and set up an account, and they can't pay their bills, they are no, because we're losing a quarter of a million in, in, in lost sales here. So something simple like that, that they can think, is this a, a green, yellow, or red customer, will help simplify the system for them. So very simple. And this is the terminology that they use throughout their sales training. So what do you reckon? Is this a yellow customer? Okay, what are we going to do then? Is this a green customer? Woohoo! Thunderbirds are go. Let's do it. Or if it's a red customer, what are you going to do? How are you going to say no politely? So is there any risk of prejudging because of that? Um, well, this is, uh, you know, one of the things I said to the, the organisation, I said, if you, I think, I think all salespeople need to prejudge. But this is the thing, is a no customer can turn into a yes customer. But you cannot offer a 24-hour delivery. If they don't have an account and they've got a pro credit rating and they won't give cash, it's a no because that's going to cost you. And I said to them, take some of that, once you see these results, take some of that quarter of a million that you're losing and put it towards and set sales incentive for the, for the team and you'll start seeing your sales go up as well. Okay, so the question was, what about when you prejudge a customer? And this is the story I always tell. Uh, I worked, uh, when I was a uni student, I worked at uh, uh, David, uh, John Martin's, which is no longer running, but John Martin's in Adelaide. And my girlfriends were going, oh, check out that dude. Look, he looks like a bum. What's he doing here? This, is, this, is the, this was the real sterling silver and real gold section. I was in the classy section. You know, oh, my God, you know, look at this. And I'm going, look, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to judge customers. He's got just as much right to be. So I went over and I said, hi, I'm Sharon. You know, did all that thing. How are you doing today? So tell me, you know, what are, what are you looking for? What can I help you with? And I'm looking for this and looking for this. And I said, yeah, come over. Because I'm thinking I'm bored. I, I, you know, it's boring if you're just not doing anything. So I showed him this and showed him this. And he said, oh, this is fabulous. He said, yeah, I want to get some of that. I said, great. And, you know, cash or charge. <laughs> he said, well, cash, actually. And pulls out this wad of money like this. And I'm going, holy crap, because I've never seen so much money in my whole life. Peels off, you know, $400. There you go. Thanks very much. 
So yeah, so we don't want to judge. But this, this one here, coming back to the, the question, was, you know, should we judge customers? No, we don't. But the bottom line is, for these people, they were losing a quarter of a million dollars in, in stock. So we need to, if they do not have an account and they've got a poor credit history, yes, we judge them. We can't do that. But I'd love to be able to help you if you can, you know, if this is what I need you to do to move you up into a yellow or... But it was just the, 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 the challenge here was the staff were making snap decisions. Sure, you've got no credit history. You've got no... You don't have cash. I'll give it to you. You can pay later and... A uh, quarter of a million dollars later. So, folks, what do we need to do? We need to look for staples. Staples are the stuff that makes you things stick. It could be an activity, it could be a story, it could be something that's going to increase the stickiness. Uh, earlier today, I talked about the fabulous trifle story with these women um, up in the Northern Territory. Explain the layers of the skin by making a trifle. That stuff was an absolute classic staple. So have a look for staples. You'll find them. Hang on to them because they're really valuable in getting that brain real estate that you need to be a successful trainer. So have a look at my blog. Link up with me on LinkedIn or tweet me if you have any questions or queries. There's articles about uh, staple it to your head on my blog. And if you can't find anything, give me a hoy and I'm more than happy to send something on. Authorised by the Government of Western Australia, Perth.